SpaceX is steadily moving towards Starship's ninth integrated flight test, with preparations ramping up for the mission both at the launch site and at the production site. Ship 35, the Starship vehicle designated for Flight 9, is currently housed inside Mega Bay 2. All six Raptor engines have now been installed, marking a major milestone in the pre-launch processing. This engine integration is a strong indicator that SpaceX has isolated and resolved the propellant leak issue that led to the failure of Flight 8. The upcoming static fire will serve as a critical validation test, recreating the same operational conditions to confirm whether the new design mitigations can withstand this stress and prevent similar failures. Only if the static fire proves successful and the fixes are verified will the FAA move forward with issuing a launch license for Flight 9. Meanwhile, Ship 35's flight partner, Booster 14, has already completed its static fire testing and is now undergoing final system level checkouts inside Mega Bay 1. During this final prep phase, the booster will undergo detailed inspections and last-minute upgrades of its critical systems, such as the engines, avionics, plumbing lines, and pressurization hardware to ensure the vehicle is fully flight-ready. Meanwhile, at the launch site, the pad is also entering the final stages of launch readiness. The launch tower's chopstick arms have been undergoing rigorous simulation tests over the past two weeks. These rehearsals include full-range actuator cycles, verifying the performance of the hydraulic pistons, locking mechanisms, and electrical feedback sensors involved in catching and stabilizing the booster post-landing. In this most recent test, the arms were rapidly actuated back and forth multiple times, causing visible oscillations. This wasn't random, it was a controlled procedure to simulate the dynamic forces expected during a real booster catch. The test helped engineers evaluate how the structure handles transient loads, including any potential resonance effects. The full sequence lasted around three hours. These drills are part of standard launch preparations, especially after the modifications made in response to Flight 8's lessons. Damaged heat exchangers and cryogenic pumps from the last mission are being replaced, and in addition, new high-throughput pumps are being installed to speed up tanking operations. To further improve flow stability and minimize pressure losses, several vaporizers and propellant plumbing lines are being replaced or upgraded across the system. Altogether, Flight 9 appears on track for liftoff sometime in the first half of next month. Shifting the focus to the second launch pad, significant construction milestones were achieved over the past week. One of the key developments was the installation of the flame diverter buckets, which were placed into the flame trench on April 12. These diverters are now being integrated with their support systems, which include reinforced steel pillars beneath them, along with plumbing lines and thermal protection components. On Wednesday morning, the top ridge section of the flame diverter assembly was rolled out to the launch site and is now being prepped for installation. Once in place, the ridge will link the two diverter buckets and serve as the first point of contact for the booster's exhaust, redirecting it into the diverters to safely channel it away from the pad during liftoff. Additionally, the ridge functions as a critical interface for the deluge system. During launch, high-pressure water is routed through internal manifolds in the ridge and expelled through precision drilled holes across its surface. This water flow helps absorb heat and suppress the intense acoustic energy generated by the engines during liftoff. Much of the deluge system's ground infrastructure is already in place near Pad B. Water storage tanks have been installed near the launch tower, and pipeline integration is in its final stages. The main feed lines, buried in trenches, will deliver thousands of gallons of water per second to the pad. Built-in holes along the inner flame trench walls will direct this water to the flame diverter system. Some of this water will also be routed to the top deck of the launch mount for thermal protection and sound suppression during engine ignition. Meanwhile, the assembly of Pad B's launch mount continues at the Sanchez site. The booster hold-down clamps have started arriving at the site and are being prepared for installation into the mount. A total of 20 hold-down clamps will be installed, and these heavy-duty mechanical latches keep the booster securely held in place on the pad before liftoff, ensuring it remains stable during engine chill-down, startup sequencing, and propellant loading. This week, four massive support legs arrived at the launch site, destined to sit atop the Pad B flame trench and serve as the foundation for the launch mount. Installation is underway, with each leg being carefully positioned and secured to prepare for the upcoming assembly of the mount structure. Unlike the fixed launch mount of the Pad A, which is permanently welded to the pad's structural base, this new system reveals a major design shift. The bolt hole pattern on the delivered legs perfectly matches the mounting interfaces currently supporting the OLM under construction at the Sanchez site, strongly indicating that the entire Pad B mount is designed to be detachable and interchangeable. This has major implications for turnaround time. At Pad A, 
Post-launch recovery often involves cutting and re-welding structural members, reworking damaged plumbing, and extensive on-site inspections, a process that can stretch across weeks. In contrast, the bolted interface at Pad B allows the entire launch mount to be swapped out quickly, moving most of the repair work off-site and clearing the pad for the next mission without delay. This modularity is a critical enabler for SpaceX's long-term cadence goals. To achieve multiple launches per month and eventually multiple Starship flights per day, the company must decouple ground maintenance from pad availability. With removable mounts, SpaceX can simply roll in a fresh unit while the used one is transported to a specialized refurbishment facility. That way, maintenance becomes a parallel task rather than a bottleneck. We may eventually see a fleet of launch mounts in rotation, each undergoing periodic inspections and hardware replacements after every few flights. This strategy not only supports high-frequency launches, but also future-proofs the system, making it easier to upgrade hardware or integrate design improvements without tearing apart pad infrastructure. Of course, this flexibility comes with trade-offs. Bolted joints require strict torque control and are susceptible to issues like preload loss, vibration-induced loosening, and fatigue cracking around flange interfaces. Each connection point becomes a potential failure point demanding strict inspection and maintenance. Still, the advantages, faster pad turnaround, offline servicing, and streamlined upgrades, likely outweigh these engineering challenges. Overall, Pad B's removable and interchangeable launch mount represents a paradigm shift in launch pad design, prioritizing swift replacement over permanent fix, and aligning ground infrastructure with the rapid reuse ethos that defines Starship's path to Mars. In parallel with the launch pad and flame trench construction, teams continue an extended series of tests on the Pad B chopstick arms moving them vertically along the tower, and actuating the claws to fine-tune their hydraulic and electrical systems. After each round of testing, engineers implement necessary upgrades, including the installation of hydraulic manifolds, accumulators, and other components, gradually calibrating the system toward full operational readiness. Despite steady progress, several months of integration, testing, and system validation remain before Pad B can be brought into full operational status. Surprisingly, on Wednesday morning, NASA spaceflight cameras spotted the Raptor V3 vacuum engine for the first time at SpaceX's McGregor facility. Until now, only the C-level version of Raptor V3 had been officially revealed. That engine made its debut last year and has since undergone multiple rounds of static fire tests at McGregor, gradually pushing performance benchmarks beyond those of Raptor V2. Now, with the vacuum-optimized version appearing on site, it's a strong signal that SpaceX has finalized its design and is moving into the hot-fire testing phase. These upcoming tests at McGregor will provide crucial data on the engine's combustion stability, efficiency, nozzle behavior, and other key parameters needed before it's integrated into a flight-ready Starship upper stage. To dive deeper into the technical architecture of this next-gen engine, check out the links in the description. I've compiled some great resources for you. Major construction progress is underway at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A Starship launch pad. The flame trench works have started near the launch tower, which was fully assembled in 2022. Recently, scaffolding was erected around the tower's chopstick arms, pointing to significant upgrades in progress. A closer look at the arm linkages reveals that SpaceX is installing doubler plates, thick steel reinforcements welded over critical joints. These plates are designed to improve structural integrity by redistributing load paths and enhancing resistance to fatigue over repeated stress cycles. At Starbase, similar doubler plates were added to the Pad A chopsticks ahead of Flight 5 in October last year. That retrofit came after engineers identified structural vulnerabilities under the dynamic loads expected during booster capture. Catching a super-heavy booster introduces complex dynamic and torsional forces that the original arm structure wasn't robust enough to handle with adequate safety margins. The doubler plates serve a dual function, increasing local stiffness at weld seams and spreading out stress concentrations to prevent crack initiation under cyclic loads. Their installation was a key part of the upgrade that ultimately enabled the first successful booster catch during Flight 5, validating SpaceX's evolving Mechazilla design. Now, with similar modifications happening at LC-39A, it's clear SpaceX is bringing booster catching capabilities to its East Coast site as well. Meanwhile, at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility, located just a few kilometers from 39A, teams are assembling the launch mount for the Florida pad. It follows a design similar to the one under construction at Starbase for Pad B. According to SpaceX, pending final environmental approvals, Starship's first Florida launch could happen by late 2025. The vehicles for these initial missions are expected to be shipped in from Starbase.
Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. The International Space Station has been a hive of activity this week, highlighted by a crucial resupply mission, crew departure, and growing concerns regarding the aging space station's operational safety. Here's a detailed breakdown of the latest developments. SpaceX launched its 32nd Commercial Resupply Services mission to the ISS on April 21st from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. A Falcon 9 rocket propelled the uncrewed Cargo Dragon spacecraft toward the ISS, carrying more than 3,000 kilograms of cargo, including crew supplies, scientific investigations, and hardware. Among the research payloads were experiments aiming to protect astronaut health through aerosol monitoring, as well as initiatives exploring next-generation pharmaceutical nanostructures for futuristic drug delivery systems and breakthroughs in biomedical research. The mission also supported a range of plant growth studies and fundamental physics experiments using cutting-edge atomic clocks. Check out the description for a link to the detailed breakdown of each experiment on NASA's official page. After a journey lasting 28 hours, Cargo Dragon autonomously docked with the ISS's Harmony Module Zenith port on April 22. The docking was overseen by NASA astronaut Johnny Kim and JAXA astronaut Takuya Onishi. With the docking successfully completed, Unloading operations began immediately, allowing the crew to begin their work with the payloads on board. Meanwhile, just two days before Cargo Dragon's arrival, the Soyuz MS-26 spacecraft completed its mission, returning NASA astronaut Don Pettit and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexei Ofchinen and Ivan Wagner to Earth after nearly 220 days aboard the ISS. The trio was launched to the ISS last September as part of the Expedition 72 mission. During their nearly eight-month stay, they orbited Earth 3,520 times and carried out a variety of scientific and operational tasks. This included critical maintenance work, such as a seven-hour spacewalk from the Russian segment to install new sensors and upgrade external hardware on the ISS. Additionally, Pettit, an accomplished astrophotographer and NASA's oldest active astronaut at 70, captured breathtaking images of Earth and celestial phenomena, contributing significantly to both public outreach and scientific documentation. The return journey began with Soyuz's undocking from the RASVET module on April 19, followed by a successful re-entry into Earth's atmosphere and a parachute-assisted landing in Kazakhstan. Post-landing, the crew underwent initial medical checks before splitting paths. Pettit now boasts a career total of 590 days in space, solidifying his legacy as a veteran of four spaceflight returned to Houston via NASA aircraft, while Ofchinen and Wagner headed to Star City, Russia. The third update regarding the ISS this week is a cause for concern. On April 17, the NASA Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel held its second quarterly public meeting at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, issuing stark warnings about the increasing risks to ISS operations as the station approaches its 2030 decommissioning. The panel warned that the ISS is entering its riskiest period due to aging infrastructure, persistent technical anomalies, and mounting budgetary uncertainties. Among the most urgent issues are the air leaks in the Russian's Vesta module, first detected in August 2019. Since then, the leaks have worsened, with the highest rate of atmospheric venting recorded in April 2024, requiring periodic repressurization of the module. Despite extensive investigations, including ultrasonic surveys and spacewalk inspections, the exact cause remains unknown, with potential culprits including cracks, weld imperfections, or material fatigue. The panel emphasized the need for accelerated collaboration between NASA and Roscosmos to address the issue. The ISS is also facing other challenges, such as maintaining a sufficient stock of spare parts for its life support systems, dealing with issues in the station's aging electrical power distribution system, and delays in cargo resupply missions, notably the first flight of Sierra Space's Dream Chaser vehicle. Furthermore, the panel pointed out the immense challenge of eventually deorbiting the 420 metric ton ISS, one of the largest human made structures ever placed in orbit. NASA is planning to use a U.S. deorbit vehicle, which SpaceX has been contracted to build, to guide the ISS to a controlled re-entry over the Pacific Ocean's Point Nemo, a remote spacecraft graveyard. The deorbit process involves lowering the ISS's orbit gradually over several months, culminating in a final burn to ensure that most of the station disintegrates during re-entry, with any surviving debris falling into a 2,000-kilometer-long footprint. The advisory panel emphasized the importance of having robust contingency plans and international coordination for the deorbit operation. Additionally, the panel reaffirmed its commitment to transitioning to commercial space stations after 2030. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates.
If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.